Okay, let's finish up our second half of chapter 20, Who's Government, Politics, Populists, and Progressives, and our time frame is 1880 to 1917, okay? Okay, and a popular uh, progressive president of, the, of this era is Theodore Roosevelt, very one of the more famous presidents that we have, okay? So Roosevelt was um, McKinley's vice president when McKinley was assassinated. So Roosevelt was sworn in upon McKinley's death, okay? Uh, now, interestingly, McKinley had been anti-reform, was pro-business, was pro-ruling elite, uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt was was a, a reform-minded president. So much like uh, Andrew Johnson with Lincoln. Now, when Lincoln was assassinated, Andrew Johnson took over, and you know we we know he was a, a pro-Southern Democrat. But but typically in American history, when a person, when a vice president takes over the administration of a fallen president, a president that's been killed or has died in office, typically you continue the the uh, the dead president's policies, you know, in his honor, out of respect. Andrew Johnson, after the Civil War, went the went completely, uh, you know, against Lincoln's point of view. And Theodore Roosevelt does the same thing here, uh, where McKinley had been, you know, against reforms, pro business, uh, in you know, pro pro uh, top of the pyramid. Uh, Teddy comes in and is different. Is he wants to? Uh, break up the trust. He becomes known as the trust buster. Uh, wants to break up monopolies and 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 break up you know uh, businesses that are that that are in his mind ripping people off. Okay, so so Teddy perhaps is America's first macho man. Okay, uh, definitely inspired by this new American character that we talked about that developed out of the Western expansion movement, the kind of John Wayne idea, right? Uh, his nickname was the Bull Moose, and his campaign of 1912 was called the Bull Moose Party. Now, is is that really a, a picture of him uh, wading across a river on the back of a moose? It appears to be. Uh, <laughs> that's the kind of guy he was, okay? His, it just kind of sidebar interesting uh, trivia here, his fifth cousin, <clears throat> it was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who would become the the president 30 years later, okay, after after uh, Theodore in 1933, uh, Franklin Roosevelt or FDR would be the president that would that would be through the Depression, World War II. Uh, he would be that the end of that Republican domination that we talked about. That's that political domination that lasted for 72 years. Okay, okay. Uh, so Teddy or Theodore um, gained fame with his Rough Riders. Okay. In the 1898 Spanish-American War, it is now uh, now called the War of 1898, <clears throat> and we'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, he gained fame uh, from his, uh, you know, taking his his regiment, his Rough Riders, uh, in in this in this war. Okay, uh, this allowed him to, because of his fame, he became the uh, governor of New York, uh, and then. Uh, uh, ultimately the vice president, and then, of course, upon McKinley's assassination, he became the, the president. And like I said, opposite of McKinley, big on, on uh, antitrust legislation, uh, pushed hard to enforce the Interstate Commerce Act that we talked about before, the Sherman Antitrust Act. Uh, these are, you know, these are two acts that are designed to regulate these big corporations, um, you know, break apart monopoly. So, so this is kind of part of his legacy. Okay, uh, this is a cartoon uh, of that era called "Reigning in Big Business," and and here you see, you see Teddy down here, um, you know, with his sword fighting all the big big business giants. Okay, so that this 1904, sorry, this 1904 cartoon from Puck. Now, Puck was a political magazine of this era. Okay. Shows Theodore Roosevelt as a tiny figure with a sword marked public service, taking on railroad developer Jay Gould, financier uh, J.P. Morgan, and other Wall Street titans. The figure at the top right is oil magnate John D. Rockefeller. Uh, in, in its reference to the folktale Jack the Giant Killer, the cartoon suggests how difficult it will be for the president to limit the power of globally connected bankers and financiers. Okay. 
So, you know, Teddy, it's, it's kind of a David and Goliath type of thing, right? And this is, you know, he is he is going to take on these big giants, but he has no fear. That's 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 the way he is, okay? Okay, let's take a break here and watch another film. Uh, this, this film is called The Square Deal for Dummies, Teddy Roosevelt's Progressive Air Reform. Now, I, I hate films that say for dummies. There's no dummies here. Uh, I don't I don't typically uh, promote those types of film, but this particular one I think is 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 okay. I don't think it's for dummies at all. Okay, so this is about the Square Deal. The Square Deal is the name of of his administration. Uh, years later, thirty years later, his cousin FDR, his administration would be, would be called the New Deal. And and you know we have these moments in presidential history where a where an, an administration has a nickname okay uh okay so let's go ahead and uh, take the, take a break and watch this film called the square deal for dummies okay and then come back okay so the square deal um teddy came into office and like i said completely changed the policies of mckinley uh went the opposite direction uh and the Square Deal is the precursor to FDR's New Deal, like I said earlier. So the, the Square Deal has three basic ideas. Conservation and natural resources. We'll learn here that Teddy was huge on, on the outdoors and conservation. Control corporations. He's the trust buster. He doesn't, he doesn't want them to, to get out of control and you know um, take advantage of people. And consumer protection. So he wants to protect the, the consumer from these big corporations. Okay. So Teddy's presidency, progressive, came out of the industrial era's uh, abuses, okay? Okay, huge outdoorsman. We saw the, the, the image of him riding a moose across the river. Uh, he was a huge uh, outdoorsman. Always wanted to be outdoors, hunting, safaris, I mean, that, that type of thing. He owned a cattle ranch in North Dakota. Was very into physical fitness. He had been quite sick as a young child. Had asthma. And so he pushed himself physically later in life to make up for it, okay? So Teddy's instrumental in the formation of national parks. During his presidency, he issued 51 executive orders to create wildlife refuges, okay? Uh, the name Teddy Bear comes from Teddy. The, the teddy bear, Bears are named after him, Okay. Because uh, he was synonymous with hunting and animals. So the, the teddy bear became popular and people sold these stuffed bears. Okay, so next time you, you cuddle your teddy bear, remember you are really cuddling that teddy, okay? <laughs> okay, uh, <clears throat> he supported environmental conservation, uh, created the U.S. Forest Service, the Newlands Reclamation Act, one of your terms, 1902, to promote economic development in the West. You know, he expanded agricultural projects there. So, you know, the, the, the West is still growing, even though it's the 20th century. It's still growing. Uh, <clears throat> he gets in trouble for inviting Booker T. Washington to the White House uh, because he's a black man. OK, uh, Teddy was a self-proclaimed wasp. What's a wasp? A white Anglo-Saxon Protestant wasps. Uh, these are the people that really start the United States. I mentioned before the. The, when the United States began in the 1780s, uh, the most of the people in the country were white Protestants, okay? Uh, and this idea of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant kind of promotes this, this idea of white supremacy. Anglo-Saxons from, from Europe <clears throat> is where these people came from, okay? So if you call yourself a wasp, you were, you were probably... You know, you, you probably think of, of your race in a in a racially superior way, okay? So he gets into trouble for inviting um, Booker T. Washington, a, a black civil right, rights leader, to the White House because you're you're not being true to your to your to your Anglo-Saxon roots, okay? Okay, so he 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 has his presidency and he retires. Uh, he retires in 1908, okay? Uh, but came back to. Uh, Four years later, in 1912, he run again, this time as a progressive party candidate, okay? Uh, so he, he wants to come back, still consume with reform. Okay, so he is about to give a speech in Milwaukee on October 14th, 1912. And at 8 o'clock at night, Roosevelt entered his car outside his hotel. 
It's an open air automobile. And he stood up in the car and started to wave his hat with his right hand to the crowd. Okay. But a flash from a Colt revolver five feet away lit up the night. Uh, so of course someone, someone shot him. Okay. Or shot somebody. Um, his stenographer quickly put the would be assassin in a headlock, grabbed the guy that fired the gun, grabbed the assailant's right wrist to prevent him from firing a second shot. Okay. So, Initially, there were no outward signs of blood, but, but Teddy reached inside his heavy overcoat and he felt a like a dime-sized bullet hole on the right side of his chest. So, so the bullet hit him and entered his chest. Okay, This is one of the 19 attempts that, that we talked about earlier on presidents. Okay, This is one of them. Uh, okay, so Teddy turns, turns around and says, he pinked me. He got me. I'm bleeding. Okay. Uh, so he, he coughed into his hand three times. Why would he do that? If you see, if, if blood comes out, that means that your lung had been penetrated by a bullet. But no blood came out. Uh, so, but you, you're still shot, okay? Go to the doctor. Uh, his doctor that, that traveled with him said, you need to get to the hospital right now. But, but Teddy gave different marching orders. He insisted on going out with his speech, even though he had been shot, okay? Uh, you get me that speech, okay? Uh, macho man, I, I already said that. So here's, here's a picture of Teddy giving the speech while he's bleeding, okay? That's an actual picture of him at this, um, at this speech, okay? And the first thing he says is, friends, I shall ask you to be as quiet as possible. I don't know whether you fully understand that I have just been shot, Okay? Of course, the horrified audience gasping, oh my gosh, and the president, the former president, unbuttons his vest, opens up his overcoat to reveal the bloodstained shirt. And of course, they're they're screaming, oh my God, they're crying, go to the hospital, sir, go to the hospital, but he, Teddy won't listen. And what's he say? It takes more than that to kill a bull moose, okay? <laughs> so... Again, I told you before, this is a this is a tough guy. Okay, so he reaches into his coat pocket and pulled out his speech that had holes through it. Okay, fifty page speech, fifty page speech folding probably thirds. The bullet hit that. Okay, that slowed slowed down the bullet. Okay, uh, and Teddy says, fortunately, I had my manuscript. So you see, I was going to make a long speech. And there's a bullet. There is where the bullet went through. He's pointing at the hole. And it probably saved me from it going into my heart. The bullet is in me now. So that I cannot make a very long speech, but I will try my best, okay? It turns out it, it, the bullet also hit his glass case. The bullet hit his glass case and, you know, uh, what would that be? 150 pages thick uh, speech and slowed the bullet down enough to where when it hit his skin, it just it just was superficial, okay? But still but still shot, still the bullet's still inside of him, okay? Uh, but without question, the bullet, the, uh, the uh, speech in his glass case saved his life, okay? Uh, without those, he, he surely would have died. So, so this, this is Teddy. This is how Teddy is. He, he's a, he, he was considered to be a, a man of great energy and called an electric battery of inexhaustible energy. And apparently, because the 53-year-old former president proved it because he ended up giving his entire speech for 90 minutes while bleeding from his wound. And people, people kept saying, Teddy, go to the hospital. This is, this is serious. And he said, I give, you, uh, I give you my word. I'm sorry, I guess I missed the slide here. I give you my word. I do not care a rap about being shot. Not a rap, okay? And, of course, few could doubt him. I mean, although his voice weakened and his breath shortened, Roosevelt glared at his nervous aides whenever they begged him to stop speaking or position themselves around the podium to catch him if he, if he collapsed, okay? So only when the speech was completed did he agree to go to the hospital. Uh, and, and, you know, it turned out to not, the, the bullet had entered his chest, but, but not deep enough to, to penetrate his lungs. So it, it turned out to not be, you know, uh, life threatening, but, but still, um, you know, this is huge news worldwide. This is a former president that is, you know, there's an assassination attempt against him. Uh, so, so what happened in this election? Did he win re-election 1912? I mean, this is, 
this is pretty good publicity, right? You couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't pay for better publicity than getting shot and 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 going off the speech anyway, right? But but the funny thing is, he did not win because because people thought he he might be crazy. Okay, I mean, the speech he gave was not that important. It was not groundbreaking. You didn't have to really do it. Uh, it was certainly not more important than his health or even his life. But Teddy insisted that, insisted that the show must go on, okay? Okay, let's change directions here a little bit and talk about, uh, again, back to our African-American civil rights movement, okay? And, and this is, you know, starting with Booker T. Washington uh, is really where this starts. You know, black rights continue to be an issue north and south, but especially the south with, the, of course, the Jim Crow laws and the Jim Crow, Crow era, okay? So the birth of the modern African-American civil rights movement starts here. Uh, uh, after Washington falls from grace, little W.E.B. Du Bois uh, takes over and calls for new strategies, okay? And, and one of them is, is what he called the Talented Tenth, okay? The Talented Tenth is a term that designated a leadership class of African-Americans in the early 20th century. So what he's saying is we got to find in the black community, the, the, the most talented 10th, like 10% of us, to come forward and help us to develop new strategies to fight segregation and disenfranchisement or the, you know, uh, being blocked from, from voting, okay? Okay, I want you to take another break here and watch the film entitled Du Bois and Race Conflict, Crash Course Sociology Number 7, okay? So go ahead and watch that film and then come back, okay? Okay, so Du Bois comes up with the idea that black America was in the condition it was in, impoverished, because of a lack of access to opportunity. We've heard that before somewhere, haven't we? We, we, heard, we've heard, we heard that in this class, okay? Uh, so it wasn't because they were inferior or, or incapable or lazy. Uh, it was because of a lack of opportunity okay now a social darwinist would say to you that they are in the position they're in because of racial inferiority uh but but du bois says no it's due to racial prejudice it's due to discrimination it's due to to lack of opportunity and keeping keeping opportunities away from these people the black codes in the south you know kept them from voting they were discriminated they were discriminated against, against, and and you know racist ideals were were you know uh, uh, thrown at them, and they were intimidated away from voting. So so Du Bois says this is what's going on. These people are are as as talented as anybody else. They're being held back by prejudice. This is a very radical idea at the time, and one that that galvanized the African American community but also made the white community, especially in the North, somewhat take notice and look and say, what's he talking about? And they start to look at that, that idea as a possibility. You know, are, are African-American people really as, you know, talented as anybody else? Are, are they really not inferior? Okay, that's what people thought in those days. Okay, so the men like the boys break this down. Okay, where again, uh, Booker T said, we are here to give our lives if necessary for you white people. We're here to be loyal to you. We're here to be, you can separate us. You can segregate us. We'll do our best. So, so this, is, this, is the, this is the new direction of the African-American um, movement, okay? Uh, rights, civil rights movement. Okay, so the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, <clears throat> the NAACP, still around. Now we don't say colored people anymore. Uh, that's a that's a you know kind of an insulting description, okay? It's much like Negro, but 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 this association is still very relevant today, and they still have the same name. I, I'm assuming to honor their their past when when this was formed, okay? So this is formed in the aftermath of a race riot. We talked about race riots and what they were: white mobs going into African American communities and burning them down and killing people and beating people up. So the NAACP became a very powerful force uh, for justice, okay? Um, and it still is today, okay? So, you know, so so 
society is, starts to radicalize a little bit. You know, you you it's not the same anymore. It's a new century, and things are changing. And people have new ideas, and you know, women are 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 making them themselves heard, and you know, African Americans still fighting for their rights, but but people aren't being so docile and so subservient anymore. They're kind of out there, you know, with with new and radical ideas. Uh, labor became very radicalized. We talked about the labor movements, okay? Uh, the Western Federation of Miners became the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, okay? And this is a very radical organization. They supported Karl Marx's views of the struggles in society, promoted socialism and perhaps communism in, in, in America. So, of course, this gets you into some big trouble, okay? Um, let's take a break here and watch the next film. This is called Interview with an IWW Member. Okay, so what this is, before you go, uh, it's only about five minutes. This is an actual interview with a person of, of, of uh, our modern time. So the IWW is still around. So this interview um, will kind of give you a background of what their ideology is. Okay, so go ahead and watch that, that film. Um, interview with an IWW member, okay, and then, co then come back. Okay, so this, this age-old argument that's, that starts because of the Industrial Revolution, that wealth was unequal, the top of the pyramid is all the wealth, a very small percentage of people, typically white people, have all the wealth, and the, and the rest of the people are, are you know, living uh, impoverished lives. Okay, this is this this becomes a, a a big deal in the 20th century. People are starting to look around, saying, we, "We're not going to take this anymore." Okay, uh, you know the 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 filthy rich. You know, very few, while well, the clear majority of the people, the workers, still struggle to make a living, and and many even today live below the poverty line. Okay. Okay, we're going to watch the another film here. Uh, this is our, I believe, our last film for this uh, this chapter, and this is called "Forgotten History: Bill Haywood and the IWW." Very short film. This 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 kind of speaks volumes of their radical nature. This is a rallying song that they would sing when they began, you know, their demonstrations to to illustrate their points. So understand, this is the turn of the century. This is over 100 years ago, so it's a little bit of a dated song today, but listen to what they're, what they're talking about. You, you, it, you know, speaks volumes of their radical nature. Okay. So go ahead and watch that film and then come back. Okay. So moving forward into politics, um, and then we're going to wrap this chapter up here in a couple minutes. Okay. Um, uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, the Democrat, the second Democrat. Remember, we talked about uh, Grover Cleveland and Woodrow Wilson were the only two Democrats elected between James Buchanan before the Civil War and Franklin Roosevelt in 1933. 72 years of Republican domination, but two Democrats were elected in that time. Here's the second one, okay? And like like uh, Theodore Roosevelt and his square deal, uh Wilson called his administration the new freedom, okay? Uh, he is known for starting income tax. Nice going, Woodrow. All righty. Thanks, bro. <laughs> what a guy. <laughs> I mean, come on. Uh, and, but also many economic reforms, okay? Such as the Federal Reserve Act. Um, this is the strength in the banking industry against the threat of failure or closing banks, uh, this would loom large in 1929 when the banks did just that. They failed and would start the Great Depression. So as much as this was a kind of a big deal in 1913, it didn't exactly work, what would it be, 16 years later when the banks all failed, okay? Uh, but other other progressive reforms of, of Wilson's era is the idea of what's called recall, uh, what what is that? I mean, this is this is still in in play today. Okay, uh, this is the idea uh, that gave citizens the right to remove unpopular officials by implementing a vote. So you don't you don't have to go through a lengthy impeachment trial or some other procedure. If you can get it in front of the um, you know uh, the people, they can vote a person out of office that easy. So 2003 in California, the governor Gray Davis was recalled and removed in Cal uh, 
in California, and that's when Arnold Schwarzenegger became the governor. Okay, uh, what did he do that got got himself into such trouble? It, the origins of, of why Davis was removed um, it had to do with the crisis in the state's electricity industry. Okay, okay, another uh, another reform that came out of Wilson's era is referendum. Okay, what's a referendum? This is voting. Uh, directly on proposed policy measures, okay, uh, rather than leaving it in the hands of the elected legislators, okay. Okay, that is the end of Chapter 20, all right, so we're going to uh, uh, close here, and uh, your next chapter is ready to go. That is Chapter 21. Thank you.